Uh, good to be with you guys again near north for those of you I haven't met. My name is Dan Osborne. I serve as one of the pastors uh, Pastors here. Great to be uh, again with you guys. If you have a Bible with you, why don't you open with me to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. Tomor- this morning we're going to do something a little bit different. We're, we've just finished our series uh, called Flourish, and we're looking at relationships, the relationships we have with one another, uh, to a relationship with work, our city, globally, all of these things. And then next week, we're going to be starting a new series through the book of Judges over the summer. And so we've got this open topic weekend. And what I want to do this morning is look at a story that is familiar to many of us, probably uh, all of us at some level have heard this story or parts of this story before. It's a story that's told inside the church. It's told outside of the church. We hear it every year. But we only hear it at one time during the year. So this morning, I, I want to rethink a Christmas story. And I promise I'm not doing this because I forgot to write another message for this weekend. But I think there's, there's something about hearing a story that we really only hear during one time of the year, kind of removing it from that cultural context, placing it right here uh, at the end of May that maybe might uh, help us to hear this story a little bit differently. Maybe there's something fresh and new that the Lord wants for our community from a story that we uh, can easily have get caught up in the sentimentality of the Christmas season. And so now, uh, my, my hope, my prayer, is that we would hear the story today with, with, with new ears, fresh, fresh eyes. So if you've got a Bible with you, open with me to Luke chapter 1. We're going to be in verses 26 through 56 this morning. It's on page 855 if you have one of the house Bibles. And we will be looking at the story of Mary, the mother of Jesus, and her response to worry. Worry is a powerful thing, isn't it? And it has the power to keep us up all night. It has the power to control your mood. Worry can ruin your day. All of us know that sinking feeling we have when we begin to to get worried about something, right? You, You know what that feels like. And the reason is because worry is a great storyteller, it, I mean, it, it can masterfully weave together our fears of everything that could happen and a narrative begins to play out in our minds of what our future will probably look like if we don't get this particular issue solved as soon as we can. Worry is consuming. And it might hit you all at once or kind of slowly encroach on your day, pulling at your memory, demanding your attention. Your mind races, your stomach clenches, adrenaline kicks in. Worry doesn't respect your schedule. Right? Worry doesn't care what you got going on today. Worry doesn't have a bedtime. It comes when it comes. And then you got to deal with it. You know, the irony with worry is that the vast majority of it is completely unnecessary. Let me show you what I mean. A recent study was done that uh, researchers wanted to look at the response that people have of worry. Why do we have this thing bubble up so often? Where does it come from and how does it How does it affect us? And here's how this study worked. Participants were asked to, over the course of a year, just kind of keep a journal about everything they were worried about. Write down everything they were worried about, whether it was something that happened in the middle of the day, something that hit them in the middle of the night, and towards the end of the year, they had these full journals full of everything that they were worried about. And at the end of the year, researchers came and they asked one question. So how many of these things actually happened? And what was interesting is that 85% of the things people said they were worried about never happened. Now, some of you are uh, like, that leaves 15% of things that do happen. And so researchers had some follow-up questions about these 15% of things that happened. And what they found was really interesting. 79% of those things, people said, they were actually glad they happened and they'd like to go through them again. 
It, it, it was, ended up being a good thing for them and they, they, they would prefer to go through that same thing again. And if you don't like math, aren't into stats, that means about 97% of the things that we worry about will either never happen or we will be glad that they did. And yet worry remains one of the most powerful and palpable emotions that we experience, isn't it? Now, I'm not saying that, you know, we don't have situations that, that aren't serious, that we don't worry about, you know, very real things, right? We worry about our health, our safety, our family's safety, our future, finding a spouse, whether or not we're loved, whether or not we have loved, our appearance, new jobs, rent, mortgage, bills, debt, credit, failures, and the list goes on. We got some real stuff going on that we can worry about. But worry is so common, it is so ingrained in our lives that a lot of times we don't even recognize anymore uh, the effect that it actually has over us. See, at the end of, end of the day, what worry really does is it steals our joy. Right? Worry takes our thoughts, our attention, our focus, and holds them captive. It doesn't ask that you think about these things. It demands that you think about these things. And we become fixated on our situation, on our problems, what's going on in our life. Because like I said, worry is a fantastic storyteller. So before we get started, let me throw out a question to you. What are you worried about this morning? Be honest, a lot of us... We come in worried about things. We're anxious about things. What are you worried about this morning? How many are, are, of you are now worried that you worry too much? What are you worried about this morning? You see, what I love about Mary's story is that she has a different response to worry. It's almost unique in all of the Bible and all of Scripture that while she has every reason to worry about what's going to happen to her, what things have been said about her, Mary is actually freed from worry and freed to worship. This morning, as we look at our story, we are going to see how. So if you're not there yet, open with me to Luke chapter 1, verse 26. I'll pray, and then we'll get started. Father God, we're mindful that in these moments, as we open your word, this is the way that you genuinely speak to us today. It's your word that has power. It's your word that has authority. Not my words, not man's words or anything, any cleverness that we might bring to, uh, to this, but your word that can bring about transformation in our life. And so uh, first and foremost, we pray that you would do a work in all of us through your word. Even while some of us are here this morning and we, we're worried about stuff. Got a situation going on in our lives and it's just pulling at us. God, would you show us what it means in your word to be freed, liberated from worry, to genuinely celebrate, trust, believe in you as we worship you. Father, we're also mindful that on Memorial Day weekend, while a lot of us got plans uh, things set in place for celebrating barbecues, beach days, and all those uh, good things. God, first of all, we thank you for a beautiful day. But God, we're also mindful that in our city, this will be and already is one of the deadliest and bloodiest weekends of the year. Lord, we know that even just uh, early Friday morning, Gentleman, David Hudson shot down and killed just a block away from our church. And so we pray for his family. We pray for those who have been affected, the six lives that have already been taken this weekend, the 23 individuals who have already been shot this weekend. Lord, we pray for the families. We pray, uh, we, we pray that you would bring people around them who know you, love you, and can comfort them. God, show us what it means to be a church, not to turn a blind eye. How dare we be deaf to the cries of our city Show us what it means to respond, that we might roll up our sleeves and point to the, uh, the, the true redeemer who is bringing his kingdom here, that people might find fulfillment, restoration, reconciliation in you and in the gospel, and would we be a city that celebrates uh, the, our risen savior. 
God, we thank you for the great kindness you've shown us in the gospel, and we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's get started. Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 26. Look with me there. Verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent, to God, uh, to, was sent from God to a city of Galilee, a uh, city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. So here's what we know about Mary. Some of you are familiar with these details. Uh, she is from a small town. Nazareth is a small town. No more than 200, 300 people living there at the time. And from the best we can tell, people from Nazareth stayed in Nazareth. They didn't go anywhere else. They didn't venture out of the city. We also know that she was betrothed, which is this process really similar to, to being engaged today. And usually women in that culture were betrothed between the ages of 13 and 15, which is probably about how old Mary is at this time. And God sends an angel named Gabriel to Mary to meet her. Here's what he tells her. Look with me at verse 30. The angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Now, we're not going to spend way too much time here unpacking this, but uh, there's a couple things we need to see from this interaction between Gabriel and uh, Mary. The first thing uh, is that Gabriel tells her because she has found favor with God, she will will have a son. Mary's going to have a son. It's not just going to be any son. It is actually going to be uh, the promised king. See, what you have to understand is that the the people of God had been waiting for a redeemer who had been promised them, and you see this all throughout the storyline of the Bible, starting in Genesis 3, the very beginning, weaving its way through the entirety of the Old Testament, is this one story, this one promise, that there will be a king who will come and restore all things, make all things right. In fact, if you had to boil down the entire message of the Old Testament into a tweet, it sounds something like this, all humanity... Though created good is now flawed because of sin, but God himself will one day send a king who will destroy the power of sin, reverse its curse, and establish his perfect and everlasting kingdom. And by the way, that is a total of 211 characters, which is well within the parameters of Twitter's new laws. When you go back to look at what Gabriel says to Mary, it's the announcement that Mary's going to give birth to him. She's going to give birth to the king, the promised one, the redeemer. Now, when you keep reading the story, Mary's got some questions about the mechanics of how all this is going to work. She and uh, Joseph have not been together, right, if you know what I mean. They're they're, they're trying to honor God by saving intimacy for marriage, which is the biblical concept that we see all throughout Scripture. They're trying to uh, save this. In fact, culturally, they would have had no uh, alone time whatsoever. And so uh, Mary's question is uh, essentially, how? (laughs) She's got some questions about the mechanics of this stuff. And not to oversimplify it, but Gabriel basically tells her that her conception is going to be a miracle. It's going to defy the laws of nature. And just to prove to her that God is certainly able to do these kinds of things, he lets Mary know that her cousin, Elizabeth, who Gabriel says is advanced in years, which is his way of saying old, and has never had a child, he lets her know that she is now pregnant. And this is uh, supposed to let Mary know that God is able to do these kinds of miracles. But I think one of the most important details, and one that is often overlooked in this whole story of Mary, is her response. Give me at verse 38. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Now, Mary understands that what an angel is, that an angel is a messenger from God, someone who speaks on behalf of God. And so she understands that Gabriel's words here are actually God's words to her. 
And I think the beauty of her response is really just the simplicity of the whole thing, right? I mean, she doesn't even ask the obvious question, right? She never even asks, why me? Here's what we need to see, though. Mary simply believes that God will do what he said he would do. She simply believes that God uh, will, will be faithful to his word. She takes him at his word. And this first scene in Mary's story kind of ends with this focus on uh, Mary's belief and acceptance that God will do what he said he would do. But her story doesn't end there, doesn't end there. Keep reading with me at verse 39. See, after Gabriel leaves, Mary decides she's going to go visit her cousin Elizabeth. And when she gets there, Elizabeth and Mary have this you know, profound moment together. Mary arrives, she kind of calls out to let Elizabeth know that she's uh, there. But before Elizabeth can even get up off the couch to go greet her, her, her cousin, the baby within Elizabeth leaps for joy. Elizabeth, we're told, is filled with the Holy Spirit. And she begins to uh, speak these words over Mary, almost prophetically over Mary. Look at me at verse 42. She says this, blessed are you among women. And blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is it granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? And there's, there's actually a lot really said about Mary here in just a couple words, right? That among women in general, Mary's going to stand out as blessed. In fact, later on, Mary herself will say that all generations will call her blessed because of what God has done in her life. Everyone's going to call her blessed. But again, Look at how Elizabeth ends this section of verse 45. Verse 45. And blessed is she, Mary, who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. See, all of what she says here, all of what Elizabeth says here, blessed among women, all generations calling her blessed. You see, it's not because of what Mary's done. It's not because of what Mary's done. And that's one of the most interesting pieces of uh, Mary's story is that Luke, the author, never tells us anything about Mary's past. Like, he doesn't tell us that she was this particularly devout Jewish girl. He doesn't tell us that uh, she would wake up, you know, really early and uh, pray three times a day late into the night. He doesn't tell us that she had it uh, going on, that she was a really righteous person. He doesn't tell us any of those uh, things. So again, what's pointed to you, It's pointed out what we might easily overlook in Mary's story. Elizabeth said Mary is blessed, not because of what she's done, not because of what she does, but because of what she believes. We gotta hear that. Mary is blessed because of what she believes. This is a profound picture of the simplicity of her faith, isn't it? You see, in this story, what Mary does, she makes a choice to believe that God will be faithful to his word. She makes a choice to believe that God will do what he said he would do. She makes a choice to trust God and take him at his word. Mary is blessed because she believes. Just real quick, make a side comment to some of you moms here this morning. I know that you are under a lot of pressure day in and day out to make sure that you're doing enough for your kids, making sure that you're uh, doing enough for them. And it's so easy to worry about not doing enough or not even being enough. Like, you got to figure out if you're going to stay at home or go back to work and uh, then worrying about what people are going to say wherever you land on that conversation with your family. you got to worry about making sure your kids are eating her, uh, healthy, organic meals, making sure they're getting to the library and the park district for enough free events that they get the right amount of playtime with other kiddos, that they have enough creative, expressive time, that they're getting outdoor uh, time, that you're using chemical-free organic cleaning supplies and don't even get me started on essential oils. My wife and I have been joking that we're going to start selling non-essential oils and just see, see what, how that plays out for us. But you see what I'm, I'm talking about here? It is so easy for all of us to worry about not doing enough. 
but not being enough. I want you to be reminded this morning that Mary is not blessed because of what she does. She is blessed because of what and who she believes. You think about that for a moment. That is liberating. It's not to say that our actions don't matter, right? That's not what I'm trying to say. But, uh, you know, our temptation is to think that our actions are the only things that actually matter. Mary believed that God would do what he said he would do. Mary believed that God would be faithful to provide for her. And she makes a choice uh, to trust him even above herself and take him at his word. And that is even more amazing when you consider all of the things Mary could have and probably should have been worried about in this moment. Let's just take, let's take a minute just to, to state the obvious here, right? Here's, here's four things Mary should have been worried about. If she's actually processing, thinking through this, here are four things she should have been worried about. She should have been worried about her engagement, right? Remember, she's engaged to Joseph. Joseph knows he's not the father. Why would he stay with her? Why would he stay with her? In fact, we know she's got a good reason to worry about this because in the Gospel of Matthew, another account of Jesus' life, uh, we're told that Joseph, when he hears about this, he decides he's gonna go try and divorce Mary quietly, right? Not, not make a big scene, but he, he wants to wipe his hands clean of this situation. She should have been worried about what was gonna happen to her. Would she return home from Elizabeth's uh, house pregnant and alone? Should have been worried about her reputation, not only hers, but in this particular culture, what happened to you individually did not just affect you individually. You see, there was no way to mitigate the damage to your own reputation and protect uh, your family. Mary has to go back to a small town that is not going to believe she didn't uh, cheat on Joseph, that her and Joseph didn't hook up sometime. They're not going to believe her. They're not going to believe what Mary has to say. She could be thinking, what well, what are people going to think of me? What, what do they think of me? Would she be judged by others? Will, will, will they think she's valuable? Should have been worried about her safety. In those days, women who were pregnant without being married could be brought into the town square, stripped and beaten, if not stoned for this. So Mary should be thinking, am I going to be safe? Could have been worried about being a mom. Remember, she, she is 15 at the most at this time. How could she not be worried about being a mom? Especially if some of these other things happen and she has to do this alone. I know some of us could keep adding to this list. There's more things we could add here. Mary had a lot to worry about. And remember, worry is powerful. Because worry is a great storyteller. Imagine the story Mary should have been telling herself right now. Imagine the story Mary could have been telling herself. But you see, I think it's only once we understand and see her situation for what it really was that we can actually see how profound her response to all of this really is. See, taking in everything that she heard from Gabriel, everything that Mary has heard from Elizabeth, thinking about what it means for her, look with me at what she says in verse 46. She says this, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed, for he who is mighty has done great things for me. And holy is his name, and his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown his strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones. He has exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the, the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. You see, in taking all of this in, processing what it means for her, thinking about every reason she has to, worry, Mary actually responds in worship. 
She, she, she turns her attention, her thoughts, her focus, and most importantly, she turns her hope back on God as she begins to remind herself all of what God has already done. And that's what you see in this list in verse 46. Look for a moment at what Mary says God has done, that he has done a great thing, that he has already shown his strength. He has scattered the proud. He has brought down the mighty, exalted the humble, has filled the hungry, emptied the rich, and helped his servant. And this whole thing comes to a climax in verse 55 where she says all of this has been done according to the word he already said to Abraham and his descendants forever. You see, See, the whole point of Mary's song here is that God has been faithful to do what he said he would do. But you see, because Mary believes that God is faithful to his word, she's liberated. She is freed from worry to worship Rather than letting her situation grip her with fear and worry, she chooses to respond in belief and trust that God would still be faithful to her, that, that he would provide for her. And I love what this belief, this conviction, this trust actually produces in Mary. Verse 46, she's got a new song, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Near North, do you hear that? Do you hear that this morning? For Mary, her joy is not found in being able to solve her problems. Her joy is not found in being removed from her situations. Her joy is not found in having nothing to worry about. Her joy is found in being able to worship and celebrate the God who was, is, and will be faithful to his word in spite of everything she should have been worried about. See, Mary believes, trusts, and takes God at his word, and so she is freed from worry to worship. Isn't that exactly what we want? Isn't that exactly what we want? Freedom from the powerful grip that worry can have over us. Freedom to experience the same kind of joy, celebration, exuberance that, that Mary says that we would be a people with her who say, my soul magnifies the Lord. Isn't that what we want? Yet at the end of the day, we can look at how Mary responds, being freed from worry to worship and, and think, man, good, good for her. That's a good story. Pastor, I got, I got real problems though. I got real problems that I'm worried with. And so the reality is for many of us, we're just gonna continue to worry. Continue to worry. For the most part, we believe that worry is innocent, right? If we're honest, I mean, I think we're just resigned to the fact that worry is probably just a part of life. It's a part of being human, right? Better yet, it's a part of being an adult, right? So deal with it. We believe that worry is innocent. But you see, the problem with that is that we, we often fail to see what worry really does to us, the tangible effect that it has over us. You see, it's not just this innocent emotion that we experience. Worry demands our thoughts, our attention and focus. Again, it doesn't ask for them. It takes our attention. It takes our focus. And we end up giving our whole selves over to what we're worried about. That's why it keeps you up at night. That's why it can keep us up at night. And again, it's because worry is a great storyteller. But what we have to see is that at the end of the day, the story worry tells us is that unlike Mary, we cannot take God at his word because he might not be faithful. He might not provide. He might not be good enough. We cannot trust him. See, worry actually perverts our understanding of who God is 
And we begin to trust and believe something else. Ourselves. And everything is riding on us. You see, that everything is riding on us. It plays out at work, right? Everything is riding on getting this next project finished perfectly on time. And it's more than just your job that's on the line. It's your future that's at risk. And so you pour yourself into, into work, making sure you hit every deadline uh, without fail, not because uh, you just love your job. You're, you're actually just worried about what's going to happen if you don't. We do this with our families. We pour ourselves into our families, making sure that we're are keeping our spouse happy, that we're all contributing enough, making sure we've got everything set up just right for our kiddos. We pour ourselves into this picture-perfect idea of what we think our families should look like, and not just because we love them, it's because we're worried about what would happen if we don't do that. We do this in our relationships as we are uh, looking for something else to satisfy us. We're looking to our our, uh, a, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a spouse to fulfill some void. And so, uh, you know what we do? We begin to worry about what we look like, our appearance, everything we've got going on in our lives. And we begin to paint this uh, big picture of who we are so that the world can see that we really are successful, that we really are worth it. And the, the crazy thing is that a lot of these things masquerade as being productive or just being, uh, j- just being productive or motivated, You gotta hear this this morning. I gotta hear this. You're not motivated. You're just worried. We're worried. What's gonna happen if we don't get all of these things figured out? See, this is why worry is so consuming. You see, worry alters our hope. Because when we are gripped by worry, the only light at the end of the tunnel is solving our problems, making sure that we are self-sufficient enough. That becomes our hope. We focus on our situation. We focus on our problems. You see, the real issue with worry is that it takes our eyes off of God, his goodness, his provision, his kindness and care. It turns them back on ourselves. And perhaps deep down, worry actually shines a light, reveals a very deep fear that we have. What if God doesn't really care about me? And so it makes sense that we would turn back to ourselves and place our hope in our ability, which is, by the way, the only solution that worry can ever offer you. See, friends, worry is first and foremost a question of belief, and we will continue to worry because often, unlike Mary, we will choose to believe, trust, celebrate, and worship something else. Worry is a great storyteller, but at the end of the day, it's not innocent. Our worry is actually idolatry. Our worry is our sin. But can I tell you that there is a much better story? See, worry tells us the story that God does not care about me. But the gospel tells us a much better story. And it starts by reminding us that God knows each one of us far better than we know ourselves. In fact, he knows us far more than we want him to know us. He knows every one of our worries, thoughts, our failures, our our imperfections, motivations, doubts. And you see, the gospel actually reminds us that because of these things, we've actually failed to live the way that God has created us to live, to, to do the things he's called us to do. We failed to earn his favor, and he knows it. 
See, our worry only confirms the fact that, that, that at some point we have all rejected God's goodness, kindness, provision, and care, and we've turned to ourselves for these things. The scripture says it this way, that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and the result, the, the produce of our sin, our worry, our, our imperfection is judgment as we are rightly condemned before the perfection of our God. And the gospel confirms all of these things for us. And yet while God knows all of these things about us, the gospel also tells us that Jesus, this promised king who lived the perfect life that we should have but failed to, to live, never once being gripped by worry or imperfection, took all of our thoughts, all of our failures, doubts, all of our sin upon himself as if it was his own. See, the story of the gospel tells us that Jesus received the judgment that we earned on the cross as he died in our place in our for our sin, and yet the story does not end there there because he rose again from the dead with the promise that anyone who would believe and trust in his work on the cross would find true and everlasting life. And all of this to demonstrate his kindness, his love, and his care. You see, friends, worry questions whether or not God actually cares about us. The gospel confirms that he does. The gospel confirms that he does. Not because we've earned it, but because he knows us far better than we know ourselves, far better than we want, and still loves us far more than we could hope. And it's believing this, the gospel, you see, that, that actually frees us from worry and like Mary truly allows us to worship because it directly gives us a much much better story to believe than worry could ever tell. Let me close with this. Friends, Christianity does not claim that you won't have things to worry about. No, in fact, you know, we, we, we don't need to pretend that uh, we won't go through difficult seasons. In fact, God reminds us in his word that we will go through these real seasons of, of, of pain and hardship. Some of you are in them right now. You might remember, we just spent three months as a church going through the book of James in the New Testament, seeing over and over again that we are either coming into a season of suffering or coming out of one. This is true for all of us as followers of Jesus. You see, the hope of the gospel is not that we will be spared from these seasons, that we'll be spared from things to worry about, but that in the midst of them, we have a God who was and is and will be faithful to do what he said he would do for us. We have a God who was and is, who will be faithful to provide, who was and is and will be faithful to care for us. Now, I, I don't want any of you to walk away this morning with the wrong idea. I don't want you to hear me saying uh, that the biblical response to worry is to just don't worry and be happy. No, you see, what we get from Mary's story this morning is, is that the biblical response to worry is not to give all of our thoughts, focus, attention, uh, and hope to fix our problems but actually to fix all of our thoughts, attention, hope, and, and focus on God himself. Friends, we, we, we do this as we are a community of people who regularly remind each other the truth of God's word that uh, we can cast our anxieties, cast our worries on uh, him because he cares for us. The gospel lets us know that we are profoundly cared and loved for in Christ. As followers of Jesus, the way we remind ourselves, the way we fix our attention, our hope, our focus back on God himself is as we open and engage in his word you see, the tendency that all of us will have is we go through seasons where we are very worried about things. The temptation all of us will have is to isolate ourselves. We begin to remove ourselves from community that God's placed us in. We begin to remove ourselves uh, from having God speak to us. And yet as we are a people who turn our attention, our focus on God himself, we are a people who begin to open his word daily. We make the discipline of being in his word and what we will see is that as God loves the sparrow, how much more does he love his children? 
As we come to him in prayer, we remind ourselves not that uh, God will be good if he gets us out of this season, but God is good in the midst of this season and is producing something in us. And he reveals this to us as we pray and he uh, shows us what it looks like in community with one another as we refuse to isolate ourselves from one another. These are why small groups are such an important part of being a follower of Jesus at Park because we can bring what we're worried about to each other and be pointed back to the one, our Father, who profoundly cares for us. Friends, when we do these things, even when we have every reason to worry, as followers of Jesus, we can respond like Mary with a new song that says, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. It's the gospel that frees us from worry to worship. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you for the great kindness you have shown us in Christ and the gospel. We ask that you continue to preach to us long after we leave this place. Show us what it means to be a community who bears one another's burdens, who's open about the things that we're worried about, and a community of people who regularly cast our worries, our anxieties on you because you care for us. Lord, free us from the grip of the, the, the story that worry can tell us. Help us to, to believe the better story of the gospel. And we thank you for all that you have done that we can call on you as a loving father who is faithful to provide for what we need. We, we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.